Uh, this has been such a fun and interesting meeting. I've been learning a lot, meeting, meeting wonderful people, and I, I really appreciate being uh, included. Uh, as was just mentioned, we're going to go out to some slightly longer time scales now, briefly. I'm an astrobiologist, and I'm going to give you an astrobiologist's perspective on the Anthropocene, at least one astrobiologist's perspective. Uh, astrobiology is, in a certain sense, largely an effort to understand the relationship between life and planets in the universe. And arguably, our own planet is at a very interesting and novel juncture in its relationship with life. And uh, that is something I want to talk about for the next half an hour. What, it, what is the nature of that transition seen in a cosmic perspective? As Bob Marley sang, we know where we're going because we know where we're from. Well, this is where we're from. At least our local story arguably begins here in the pre-solar nebula from which the planets of our solar system formed. They formed by a process of accretion, a, gra a gravitational gathering, clumping together and larger and larger chunks colliding with more and more violence until we were left finally with the current planets. Everything fall, fell from the sky ultimately in this process of accretion. Now we're going to fast forward through the next uh, four and a half billion years, but imagine you were a patient and inquisitive alien watching our planet for the past several billion years. What would you have seen? Well, obviously you would have seen the continents drifting around the surface, collecting and splitting apart, and shifting puzzle pieces. You would have seen the polar caps growing and shrinking in this sort of polyrhythmic, quasi-rhythmic pattern uh, as the Earth, Earth shifted between ice house and greenhouse conditions. And about 400 million years ago, you would have started to notice the greening of the continents. But the night side, the dark side of the Earth, would have stayed a deep, unbroken black for almost all that time. Okay, maybe the occasional flash of lightning, the occasional meteor flash, a little splash of aurora now and then, and then starting about 400 million years ago, some forest fires occasionally, but pretty dark on the night side until, whoa, what is this? Something very new, these bright points starting out in certain coastal areas and then spreading in these weird webs with this, these forms that are pretty organic looking but suggest some other kind of geometry as well. And along with this, you, you, you would notice changes in the atmospheric composition, changes in the ocean, changes in the, the nature and geometry of the land on the continents. And then very recently, in just the last 50 years, a, a blink of an eye in this cosmic view, you would have noticed something else. Little bits of the Earth leaping back off into space, buzzing around the nearby space, and even some of them zipping off to the other planets and sending radio messages back in a kind of, in a kind of curious anti-accretion. Everything fell from the sky in accretion, and now four and a half billion years later, we have this curious anti-accretion. And it's curious because it's weird, it's strange, but it's also the hallmark of, of a certain kind of curiosity, technological curiosity, arriving on this world. And this is all very new, very, very new. This all happened in, in my lifetime. I know I'm not that young, but still. Um, the very first of these missions to another planet, uh, the Mariner 2 mission to Venus uh, happened, launched when I was two years old, and just this week, the Akatsuki mission, the Japanese space agency, arrived in orbit around Venus, and just this year, we finally got to Pluto. So this is, this is a brand new effort, and my career has been spent doing uh, what we call comparative planetology, being involved in spacecraft missions to the other planets, and then trying to use the perspective we get 
and comparing the stories of those planets, and then finally, hopefully, also revealing some new aspects to the Earth story, uh, to, as uh, T.S. Eliot said at the end of our exploring, to come back where we started and see it as if for the first time. So, the particular application of this field to the Anthropocene that I got involved in for the last few years came about as a result of an opportunity that I want to tell you about because it's an opportunity I think some of you might be able to take advantage of. The Library of Congress uh, established in 2012 a new chair in astrobiology, which specifically was for somebody to undertake sustained research at the intersection between astrobiology and wider societal questions. And I applied and was the first person to get this chair. I was the inaugural chair of astrobiology, and my project that was selected was astrobiology and the Anthropocene. But I also mention this because it's still very new and they're looking for good candidates. And almost everything I've heard at this meeting would potentially uh, fill that role. Big history definitely applies. I mean, it's astrobiology writ large. Uh, I think the Earth story and some of the, many of the concerns we've heard would fit. It's a great deal. They pay you well and they give you amazing support. And they're looking for interdisciplinary scholars. They're not just looking for astrobiologists. They're looking for people from the humanities as well as the other scientists who want to think about the broad questions of astrobiology, which really is the evolution of life, the universe, and everything. So think about applying, some of you. Um, now, uh, what I'll tell you about for the next 20 minutes or so is uh, some of the major uh, conclusions or, or, or thoughts that I, that I reached through this, this activity. Now, as I mentioned, I do comparative planetology, and of course, one can give many lectures on that, and, uh, and I'll, I'll try to avoid <laughs> giving many lectures on that, but uh, the specific thing that I do is climate modeling. I'm a climate modeler. I model climates of other planets, mostly, although I've done some paleo-Earth. But we use the same models and same techniques and, of course, the same laws of physics. And some of this has given us new perspective on the long-term evolution of our home planet. If I could sum up a lot of what we've learned on one slide, it would be to say that although Venus and Mars, our two closest siblings to the Earth, have obviously evolved in radically different directions, this seems to represent a divergence from much more similar origins and early environments. We have reason to believe that both Venus and Mars had much more Earth-like conditions when they were young and quite possibly were both homes for life. That's still something we're searching for evidence of. So it may be that on planets in the universe, the persistence of habitable environments over cosmological timescales is what could be more rare, not the conditions for the origin of life. At least the local, looking around the neighbors, that's one of the impressions we get. So then we can see there was this early branching point when we compare Earth's story to those of the neighbors that there was this early divergence. For nearly, now for nearly four billion years, our planet has been evolving under the influence of major forces that have apparently not been at work on the neighboring planets. And really, this may have been two divergences. I think the origin of life is a separate event from the origin of a planetary biosphere, the time when life becomes deeply integrated as a global property of the planet. And that's an interesting question. But it's become clear that the defining characteristic of Earth is planetary scale life. Uh, in other words, life is not just something that happened on a planet here, it's something that happened to the planet. Life is something that a planet becomes, it's a property of the planet, deeply embedded in the workings of Earth. And the more we study Earth and the history of life, the more we realize this, that it's not just an afterthought or a condiment placed on top. It's life has become deeply integrated in the functioning of the planet. Now, we seem to be possibly at another branching point in the history of this planet. More recently, the Earth has come under the influence of a new geological force, what we've been talking about at this meeting, the, the global activities of humanity defining the Anthropocene. And this perspective makes me wonder, could intelligence like life become a planetary property? Could there be planets that in some sense, as a planet can in some sense become alive, can a planet in some sense 
become aware and conscious? Can uh, the functioning of intelligence, awareness, consciousness, what have you, become deeply integrated in a stable way in the functioning of a planet in the way that life apparently can? Well, as we've heard, we are not the first species to come along and radically change the Earth. And we've heard about the great oxygenation event, some, somebody called it a holocaust, um, where cyanobacteria came along, poisoned the Earth, the atmosphere with oxygen led to mass die-offs of uh, many, probably most of the species that had evolved up to that time. They had to adapt or die. And not only that, but it led to a huge climate catastrophe. All that oxygen destroyed the methane greenhouse that was keeping Earth warm up to that point, collapsed the climate, the Earth went into a deep freeze, a snowball Earth, and um, it was probably a close call to irreversible planetary destruction, or it could have been. In other words, once things get really frozen over, it may be hard to get out of that state because the, you're reflecting so much sunlight, it keeps it frozen. So, all those cyanobacteria were doing were innocently exploiting a new energy resource to the greatest extent they could, solar energy. And, but yet those irresponsible bacteria caused a global environmental catastrophe. Now, of course, we don't really think of them as irresponsible. They're just bacteria. But it does raise an interesting question, then, what is the difference between them? We see ourselves behaving in much the same way, and we're, we're horrified. It seems deeply irresponsible. So, so what have we got that the cyanobacteria didn't. And then this also could be a long discussion, and I'll keep it to one slide here, but these so-called human qualities, and they're all each one controversial and arguable language, tool use, art, technology, but together we can consider them the human qualities, which are obviously new on this planet, and I love the description that David Christian gave on the first day of this meeting of, of cumulative knowledge. I'm going to have to start borrowing that, or I'll, don't worry, I'll cite you. But it was a really, really nice way to describe what is, is new in this, this interesting development on Earth. Now, we can ask, though, and I think the discussion right before lunch uh, forces us to ask, are these qualities adaptive, or is this an evolutionary dead end on a planet? Or could this possibly be a potential gateway to really great longevity? Uh, if civilization, quotes, is now a planetary and even geological process. What are its prospects, both here and elsewhere in the universe? So to try to get a handle on that, I've, I've looked at the different kinds of transitions that can happen to planets. I got into this by looking at climate catastrophes on Venus and Mars, and I've extended this now uh, looking back at Earth and the different kinds of climate catastrophes that can happen here. And I would like to suggest that there are writ large four categories of planetary change, classified with respect to the role of life on the planet, the role of life in these different kinds of catastrophes. And these are, one, random, two, biological catastrophes, three, inadvertent catastrophes, and four, intentional changes. And I'll briefly describe each of these to you now. So, Random catastrophes are just, um, you know, when, as the bumper sticker says, stuff happens. Uh, bad things happening to good planets. The obvious canonical, canonical example is uh, an asteroid striking the planet, as one did 65 million years ago, and in fact uh, ha has happened repeatedly on Earth, and we know throughout the solar system and the universe there's a lot of stray material moving at high velocities. Planets get hit, but this is not the only kind of random catastrophe. There are also things like large igneous provinces, that is, massive impulses of volcanic resurfacing that do uh, extreme makeovers of the climate. Uh, and this has happened many times in Earth history. For example, um, these Siberian traps that uh, were voluminous outpouring of flood basalts 250 million years ago in um, what is now northern Russia, uh, led to the Great Dying, the largest mass extinction ever on Earth, the Permo-Triassic extinction 250 million years ago. And several other of these larger igneous provinces are associated with mass extinctions and major changes in climate. So that's, uh, that's what I mean by random catastrophes. And this, these obviously will happen to some degree on all planets in the universe, and they'll probably happen more often on the better planets, that is, the more interesting planets, 
coincidence with the kinds of geological flows that will lead to, lead to life. So I actually think planets that are good for life will have more of these uh, kinds of natural disasters. Now, the second category of planetary change is um, what I call biological catastrophes. And we already heard about, uh, not just from me, but other speakers about the oxygen catastrophe, and that's a great example, where just the evolution of species, doing what species do, leads to a massive change in the global environment that causes mass extinction. There, and I mentioned the cyanobacteria and the snowball earth. There are other examples, too. I, I, for the sake of brevity, I won't go into that now. Uh, other examples, I just wanted to establish the category. The third category of, um, of planetary change is what I call inadvertent change. And that is where one species becomes very adept at a certain kind of solution to local problems, technological solutions. They're really good at applying technological solutions to local survival problems. And they become so successful at that that they begin to have global influence without having any idea that they are doing so. Um, this is what I call the Anthropocene dilemma, having global influence without any global control. And it's symbolized here by this traffic in, uh, in California. Each one of these cars is being driven by a driver who has agency and can see obstacles, see dangers, and if necessary, steer around it. But yet, if you look at the global transportation system as a whole, is anybody driving it? Not really. It's happening by some other kind of mechanism. So, so this is what I mean when I talk about inadvertent planetary changes. Um, now, some obvious examples, a lot of what we've heard about in the last couple of days, the Keeling curve, sea ice, all the associ changes associated with climate change, and also um, the ozone hole we just heard about, and that's an example of, certainly of inadvertent change. One, by the way, that we discovered because we were exploring the planet Venus and noticing some strange things were happening in the upper atmosphere when chlorine was attacking oxygen species. And some smart people said, oh, wait a minute, aren't we putting chlorine in Earth's stratosphere? Oh, uh-oh. So it's a, a very concrete example of the value of comparative planetology. Anyways, um, but this ozone hole is an example of of the third kind of planetary change, but it's also a good example of the fourth kind of planetary change, as we heard about from David this morning, intentional planetary change. Um, and it's, it's, as we heard, a good news story. Uh, the scientists sounded the alarm, the world got together to some degree and had conversations and decided to take action, passed laws, made treaties, and it's working. It's on a path to being fixed. Yay, go humanity, go Earth. Um, of course, we have other challenges, uh, as we've been hearing a lot about, but what I want to suggest is that there are many other kinds of changes that ought to go in the same category of intentional change. Obviously, fixing global warming is still something we're, you know, as we've been discussing, just getting a handle on, but it certainly would be, at this point, an intentional change. But I would also put the category defense against asteroids and comets. If we're going to talk about the long term, we're going to talk about, uh, and survival, we're going to talk about human beings intervening technologically to save ourselves and other species. In the long run, this could even be a kind of payback. We may be causing a mass extinction now. We may be able to prevent the next mass extinction. Uh, and then also on, on the long run, we have to remember that climate is not always by itself left alone in a benign state. We've been lucky for the last 10,000 years. We've lived through this warm, stable climate state. But if we're around, for 10,000, 100,000 millions of years, then we're not going to want to sit back and watch another ice age happen. That would, there's no way uh, our civilization and most of the species we share the Earth with now today could survive that. So in the long run, climate intervention takes on a different kind of tone than the one we heard about this morning. Um, so just to sort of list a few of these what I call planetary changes of the fourth kind, intentional global changes. We have ozone replenishment, uh, as I mentioned, already underway. Intentional halting or reversal of industrial global warming. 
which at this point would be a kind of climate intervention in the sense that we need to get together and talk about intentionally changing our relationship with the planet. And in that overall sense, this is a kind of geoengineering. It's a different kind, a much more benign and sort of softer geoengineering. Um, planetary defense against asteroids is currently a work in progress. We are not going to go the way of the dinosaurs. We don't have to, and the other species we share the planet don't have to. Um, geoengineering is, is rightfully controversial, uh, but I put it in this category of kinds of purposeful interventions. The, um, and, and I very much share the view we heard this morning that we, at, at present we don't know enough about the Earth system and it would be real folly to uh, attempt a cure that could very well be much worse than the disease. The terraforming of Mars is currently being modeled. And I am, although I'm a planetary scientist and an astrobiologist, I'm not a proponent of terraforming Mars on any kind of certainly nearby time scale. But I'm very glad people are modeling it and have been, have been modeling and thinking about it because it's, it increases our ability to think about how we would intentionally change a planetary climate thoughtfully instead of unintentionally stumbling into a change in climate. And um, so I think it goes in this category. That's a, it raises a bunch of really interesting ethical and technical questions that I won't go into now, but I think it does belong here in the category of intentional change. And then as I mentioned, eventually we're going to want to, assuming we, or some descendant of us is here for the next 50,000, 100,000 of years, we will want to prevent future ice ages. They would be much nastier, actually, than any, even any climate um, change that's approaching us this century. So um, it's something we will eventually, if we're to survive, have to think about. And then as we're going to really long time scales, since we're being cosmological here, the sun is heating up. And Earth will experience an inevitable global runaway greenhouse, it'll go the way of Venus in a couple billion years, again, left to its own devices. If we're here or anybody sentient and technological and thoughtful is here that long, they'll have plenty of time to think of ways to solve this problem. Now, uh, if we wanted to get nerdy, we could put all this on one plot with, uh, this is logarithmic and time scale, and oh, I didn't mention this, but uh, in a way, um, global health uh, is, is part, of, part of these uh, global solutions I'm talking about, and we have some problems that are solved, some that are on track, uh, one that is currently requiring serious effort, and then there are these other ideas on different time scales. Planetary defense, I think, will be up and working anyway, so we need to worry about it maybe on the, certainly on the thousand-year time scale. Ice Age interference we need to worry about in the 10,000-year time scale, and then eventually, if we're around for, if anybody's around for a billion years, billions of years, they need to worry about the evolution of the sun and how to either fix it or move. Um, now, so to summarize these kinds of changes, random, and, and where they may happen in the universe, random planetary changes will happen everywhere in the universe on all planets. It's just part of the nature of the universe we live in. Biological catastrophes will happen on all planets with life, I think, because it's the, we can uh, argue, and astrobiologists love to, about how to define life and what its properties are, but I think basic things we can agree, life multiplies and life alters its environment. And therefore, I think that any planet with uh, a sustained biosphere will experience these biologically induced catastrophes. Now, these two other categories of change, three and four, that what I call the, the cognitive planetary changes, where, um, uh, where um, we gotta be careful with the word intelligence because it's broader than what I'm talking about, but technologically enhanced intelligence alters the planet in either inadvertent or intentional ways what about those? Do those exist elsewhere in the universe? And that leads us into the uh, territory of SETI, the search for extraterrestrial intelligence. And it also leads us to think about the long-term longevity of civilization. Because when you do the math of SETI, you realize that longevity is the real question. If, if civilizations last for a long time, then there should be a lot of them to find. If they only last as long as We've been technological, arguably, hundreds of years, if, well, depending on how you define it. If you define it by radio telescopes, then we've been technological less than a century. If all civilizations last that long, then we would never find another one. So 
longevity is, uh, comes up a lot when you do the math of SETI searches. And this leads to the question of what is the Anthropocene in terms of its persistence, in terms of the kind of geological change it is? Is it just an event? Is it going to be just an event which will leave a layer in the strata, like the, what we used to call the KT, the, the K? PG boundary, the, uh, the uh, dinosaur extinction that left this centimeter thick clay layer and then things, things went on after that? Is it uh, an epoch? That's what it's been proposed at, which implies that it will be something a little bit more sustained. Or could it even be something else? A planetary transition, a fundamental change in the planet, of which there have only been a few in the history of the planet. Thing, uh, changes like the origin of life or the Cambrian explosion when life suddenly became complex. Um, now, it could be that the story of humanity is such that it will just be an event, and my friend John Lomberg drew a, a cartoon representing that possibility, where the uh, Goldilocks zone is too hot, too cold, and too dumb. I'd like to think that we'll be able to do better than that. Um, but that's certainly, as we've been hearing, one possibility. But uh, it really comes down to this question. Is human-style intelligence adaptive in some way? Can it be adaptive? Or is it inherently self-limiting? Now, when we look at the long-term history of the Earth, we've talked a lot about the Anthropocene as a possible new epoch. That's what it's been proposed at. But I also think we may be on the verge of, or seeing hints of, or at least the possibility of, a very different kind of change. If you go over to the left side of the geological column, you see the eon boundaries. And there have only been four eons, as geologists discuss them. Sorry, this is a little fuzzy, um, this slide. But these, each, each of these boundaries represent, represents a fundamental change in the role of life on the planet. Roughly speaking, and don't throw anything at me, geologists, but um, getting out the chainsaw, but roughly speaking, the boundary between the Hadean and the Archean is the origin of life. And roughly speaking, the Archean um, led to the Protozoic right around the time of the great oxygenation and all the major changes that that caused in the Earth. And the boundary between the Proterozoic and the Phanerozoic, this is the origin of complex life, the Cambrian explosion. Now, it seems to me that we are potentially on the edge of an eon boundary because if cognitive technological life is going to be, can possibly become a stable, part of the way the Earth operates, that is as significant as any of these other changes. Now, we've heard a lot of speculation of what will these archaeologists of the future find when they come and dig up our strata, and they, you know, maybe there'll be ants trying to hold rock hammers. I'm not sure how they do that without opposable thumbs, but I would like to know. Um, and it is, it is an interesting thought exercise for putting our time in perspective to imagine us not at the end of the column, but somewhere deep down and imagine what might be further. I like to think that we could be at the beginning of a new eon, which I call the Sapiozoic. Now, that's an aspirational title because sapiens means wise. We perhaps um, foolishly or arrogantly call ourselves homo sapiens, which means wise apes. But nonetheless, if there is to be a long geological eon where intelligent life becomes a stable part of the operating system of the planet, then I think that would require what we can define as wisdom, a longer and wider view of the role, a, a, an awareness of the role that is being played. Now, we've heard a lot about the dangers confronting us, and they're, of course, very real. And some people have uh, construed this as a kind of 21st century bottleneck. And people like Martin Rees, who's a really smart guy, uh, astrophys famous astrophysicist in England, he gives us 50-50 for making it through the 21st century. And E.O. Wilson has similarly discussed um, this, this notion of a bottleneck. I don't want to go into it in great detail here because I'm limited on time, but you know, there are many possible threats to our continued survival. And I think uh, this afternoon we're going to hear um, a little bit more about some of these uh, new, um, both the potential and threats of some of these new kinds of technology. But it's clear, I think, to many of us that with the acceleration of technology and with the expansion of population and everything we've been talking about, that the 21st century is a time when a lot of 
trends can come to a head. And it's a very frightening prospect, but there's this also, the idea of a bottleneck also implies that there's another end, that if you get to it, uh, things could be very different. And as I've described, there are aspects of our technology that are maybe in their infancy, which could have the opposite effect, which could lead to very long survival. We can have chances to survive that no species has ever had, because like the dinosaurs couldn't, we can see that asteroid coming, we can see that ice age coming. So if we can get a handle on ourselves, there's at least the possibility of making it through that bottleneck and becoming a very long-lived kind of phenomena on the planet. Oh, and there, to make things worse, there's even the threat of zombies. Um, but um, now, this implies the possibility of a bifurcation in the lifetime of civilizations. If there's a bottleneck, it may be that most civilizations at our stage are short-lived. But yet, it may be that there's a possibility of um, what I call quasi-immortality, defined thusly, that if you get that deep understanding of nature and of yourself as a species, as a civilization, then in fact you may have access to a kind of longevity that no species has ever had. It may not be likely, but I uh, contend that it's possible. And that leads to some really interesting possibilities. And as far as SETI goes, if you do the math, and I'm actually going to skip a little bit here because I'm running low on time, so I'm not going to do the math now, but the, I'll, I'll give, give you the metaphor that it may be that civilizations are like seahorse babies, and seahorses have the reproductive strategy where they make a whole lot of them, and almost all of them do not survive very long. Uh, they almost all die when young, and yet there are seahorses. And it may be that... Um, if there's this bottleneck model that young civilizations are like, at our stage, are like baby seahorses. And so it may be that our chances for long-term survival are not closely coupled to the probability of advanced civilizations elsewhere in the universe, or, as Franz Kafka put it, there is an infinite amount of hope in the universe, but not for us. Now, I don't really believe that. I'm full of hope for the human future. I think we're in for a very rough century, but I think our long-term prospects can um, still be seen as good, and we just have to find the right path. Now, when did the Anthropocene start? This is my favorite candidate for the type, the stratigraphic signature of the Anthropocene, the footprints and equipment left at the Sea of Tranquility on the moon. Now, I know that's not very helpful for Jan and his commission. It's not a very pragmatic um, suggestion for the Anthropocene strata, and yet it's symbolically potent and unmistakably the mark of a new kind of species on this planet. So um, that's still my proposal. I don't, accept, I don't expect it to be accepted, but I propose that the boot prints on the moon are the beginning of the Anthropocene. Now, I think that there's an important way in which the Anthropocene has not started yet, or maybe it's just getting started. Thinking in terms of these categories of planetary change, I think the Anthropocene begins with the end of our innocence, with our mass awareness, of our role as world changers, that's what allows us to have the feedback between the effects we see globally of our behavior and our behavior. So we're like those drivers avoiding obstacles rather than sleepwalking, sleep driving into them. Um, what makes the Anthropocene unprecedented and worthy of the name is our growing knowledge of what we are doing to this world. So up to this point, we have been unconscious world changers. I call that the proto-Anthropocene, where we're making changes of the third kind. It's a species doing powerful things, having no idea that it is even doing them. And then it starts to become aware. I think we're in the early stages of that. We have to bring it about as quickly as possible. I mean, obviously, some of us in this room are aware of it, and a lot of individuals are, but when I say we, we have to do our best to promote a global awareness. I think this is something that is actually rapidly spreading and rapidly changing, and that's why I have hope. But so we can define a new phase, which I call the mature Anthropocene, changes of the fourth kind, where, there is, where our actions are defined by feedback between awareness and our global actions, where as an, in, as an intelligent individual behaves based on sensory input from their surroundings, 
we as a global intelligence need to develop that basic property of intelligence. And I think we are developing it. So this self-aware global change is then a completely new kind of phenomenon on the planet. And looked at in this way, the Anthropocene is actually something to aspire to. It's something that is just getting started. And if we create a mature Anthropocene, then this epoch could be the first epoch in the Sapiozoic Eon. Or there could be a Sapiozoic Eon even if we don't make it. Some other species could start to behave this way or even some other civilization of humans. But I would like to think we have a fighting chance. So let's, let's fight for it. Now, if we are successful, then we are trying to create what I call Terra Sapiens or a wise Earth. This would be a human race, a planet dominated by planetary changes of the fourth kind, a mature Anthropocene, and, but in order for our civilization to survive, we need to become a new kind of entity on, on the planet. We uh, need to learn to live comfortably over the long haul with world-changing technology. That's not going away. We're not going to stop having world-changing technology, so we have to develop a new relationship with it. Now, I actually think this is happening. Uh, is it happening quickly enough? I don't know, but can we do it? I think we can. If you look at the deep history of our species, you see a lot of what makes us human is our ability to work collectively and use our imagination and solve problems, and tell stories, and find solutions. During the Pleistocene Ice Ages, we became fully human by, we became modern humans, when climate change came and forced us to huddle together around campfires in caves, drawing pictures on the walls and telling stories, inventing new solutions to our problems. Well, now climate change is upon us again, a, kind, a different kind of climate change of our own making, and we have to huddle together in our new caves. There's, there's, there's a, another change happening on Earth that isn't as apparent when you look at Earth from space, which is these networks of global communication. Our planet is being rapidly knit together. And I think an awareness of ourselves as a species with common problems and with an enlightened kind of self-interest to solve those problems is rapidly increasing. And so huddled around these new global technological campfires, we again have to come together, tell ourselves new stories, and find those solutions. So finally, I'll end here. One of the fun things I did at the Library of Congress was a little side project I called uh, A Brief History of the Future, where I read a lot of predictions of the future written in the past. A lot of stories about our time written 100, 200, several hundred years ago. And it was interesting, and I found it kind of heartening in a way, because nobody got it right. Nobody is good at predicting the future. They, miss, they get the trends, they miss the game changers. And this exercise convinced me that nobody here can accurately predict the world of 2100. Not climate modelers, certainly not econom economists, Certainly not religious leaders. <laughs> Thought I'd say that for your benefit. Um, uh, we, we all have hints and ideas, but I think that, you know, again, we miss the game changers. It's fun to speculate about what those game changers might be, but the point is, uh, this, this gives me room for hope. I think that, that there are these nonlinear tipping points also in human awareness and in human responses that will feed back on the system in surprising ways. I'll quote here from one of my favorite books that I discovered in this process of reading the, um, the uh, Brief History of the Future, which was by J.D. Bernal, written in 1929, The World, the Flesh, and the Devil. And this is a book that Arthur C. Clarke called The Most Brilliant Attempt at Scientific Prediction Ever Made. And, and Kate, I, I urge you to read this book. It's, it's a page turner. It's great. But in case you don't get a chance to read it, I'm going to tell you the end. This is the final paragraph in the book, and it's not really a spoiler, you should still read it, but Bernal ends with this question. He said, we hold the future still timidly, but perceive it for the first time as a function of our own action. Having seen it, are we to turn away from something that offends the very nature of our earliest desires, or is the recognition of our new powers sufficient to change those desires into the service of the future? which they will have to bring about. So personally, I think we're just getting started on this planet, and I'll end on that note.